Hi everyone. Yeah. Okay, we have uh, guys who are involved or just heading uh, some three prominent uh, Emacs package uh, managers. So we have Nick, Steve, and Dimitri. You you heard Nick speak about some other ideas he had. You heard Dimitri speak about Alget, but they'll all introduce the projects shortly, and then after that, you feel free to ask them any questions. It's a kind of like a free form panel. So give them a warm welcome and welcome. Like, thanks. Shall I, shall I start off and... Okay, well, I'll start off. I'm Steve Purcell. Um, I'm a co-maintainer of, of Melpa. Has anybody heard of Melpa? Oh, well, that's encouraging. Um, so Melpa is, is a, an archive of um, installable packages compatible with package.el. Um, it's been around since, I think, late 2011, when Donald Curtis started it. Um, I'd separately been using LGET for, for quite a while, and then um, when I saw that some other authors were starting to upload their packages to, um, to Marmalade, I thought, well, that's fantastic. I'm going to start using that. So I started uh, packaging some things up, uploading them there. Um, I'd find other packages that I wanted to be able to install on my own machine, so I'd, I'd submit packages to Marmalade for that. Um, so sometimes you'd be trying to contact the upstream authors and get things fixed up, and um, uh, sometimes you'd have a package of your own that someone had already uploaded to Marmalade, and you had a new version of it, and you wanted to, to update that version. Um, but in, that, in situations like that, I, I came up against some of what I perceived as limitations with um, with Marmalade. Um, all the packages there are owned by the person who uploads them, who may or may not be the package author. And um, if you are the package author and you come along and you want to upload your authoritative new version of a package, um, you have to get the other person who originally uploaded um, the code to give you permission to overwrite it. Um, and, and that was a little bit frustrating for me. And, uh, and also I saw th um, from from the packages that I uploaded myself that I'd found elsewhere on the web. Sometimes you had to kind of um, take the Zlisp code that you've, you've found, you want to turn it into a package, but it's not in the right format. So you download it, you can hack the headers a little bit and um, maybe add a package requires line um, and submit it to, to Marmalade. But then effectively you forced your own hacked version um, of a package um, that somebody else wrote up onto to Marmalade um, in a modified format, you've stolen ownership of that package, um, at least until somebody contacts you about it. And I, some of these things just irked me. Uh, I wasn't smart enough to, to figure out what a good answer would be, but uh, around that time, uh, about the beginning of last year, I uh, came across Melpa, um, which had been started by Don Curtis. And um, uh, it just looked like like what I wanted. What I wanted was something a bit like uh, homebrew, where you just had simple recipes um, to describe files, but I didn't want to have to build them locally. Um, so the, the interesting thing about Melpa is it's kind of like um, a server-side version of Alget. Um, you don't need any software on your own machine other than the standard package.el. You add Melpa as, um, as a download location. Um, the Melpa server, um, by running an Emacs there, does all of the work of downloading packages from upstream source control using SVN or Git or, uh, or from the Emacs wiki, which I'm sure we'll end up coming back to. And it produces package.el compatible packages, which are then available for download and installation. Uh, and I thought, well, that, that sounds quite good, um, because I don't have to have Darks installed on my machine um, just because some particular package is, is in a Darks repository. Uh, I thought that worked quite well. Um, so all of the packages there at the moment are uh, snapshot packages. They're just the latest leading edge code directly from the upstream developer's um, source code repository. Um, but at least it is directly from the upstream uh, developer's source code repository, um, or the Emacs wiki. Um, so we've had about uh, 1,800 commits now from about 100 contributors. Um, we've got just over 800 packages, and I think just by a hair we've got more packages than, than any of the other package repositories. Um, so that's my background. It seems to have taken off 
obvious limitation is it's it's all bleeding edge code. Uh, we'd like to get to a stage where we can look at upstream version tags and then build stable versions of, of packages as well and make those available in a parallel repository for people to download and install. Um, and then developers would not need to do anything other than make sure that they have the correct headers in their package, check their code in, update tags as necessary, and new installable packages would pop up magically on Melpa. So that's that's kind of the dream um, and kind of getting there gradually. Um, yeah, it's it's kind of interesting because uh, Melpa is obviously an, an Elpa package repository. Um, uh, so just to give you a sort of slightly higher level, Elpa came along, uh, Dimitri gave the overview, uh, Elpa came along, what, three or four years ago? Something like that. Um, uh, Tom Tromey uh, wrote this thing and it eventually got in and Richard had always, Richard Stallman had always um, been opposed to a packaging system because it would let arbitrary linkage into Emacs, which is something that he politically opposed. But when Richard stepped down from being maintainer, this was basically the first thing that maintainers did. Um, so, I mean, we everybody had been screaming about it for ages. So there was a, an Elpa repository and um, very quickly established that it was run by Tom. Um, and then Phil Hagel worked on the code and very cleverly, and I'm not sure if anybody noticed or, or not what he was doing, but he deliberately made it so that you could have multiple package repositories. So not just Elpa, but a whole bunch of stuff. And that was a really smart move. We're very lucky that he did that because it means that Melpa and Marmalade and all of these other things, they, they can work with minimal effort. Um, so basically, as soon as he did that and uh, the package code was released, uh, there's a guy called Nathan Weisenbein who now works on the Dart project at Google. He's a very clever guy. And he decided he would write a package repository for these Emacs packages. The only trouble is that he decided that he would write it in Node.js um, at the time when Node.js, I think, was... Uh, well, I think it had only just been thought of, and um, basically somebody had just typed into the machine, and Nathan went, oh, I'll have that, and, and tried to build a stable server on it. Um, he also used MongoDB. Um, so he's a smart guy, but uh, they were poor tool choices. I think he was, he was just playing around with this stuff, trying to um, have fun. But then, by accident, he created something that was quite useful, and people started putting packages in it. And, oh, no, it's a nightmare to run. And then Nathan couldn't really look after it. And I'm such an idiot that I said I would do it. Uh, oh, dear. I already said how uh, I'm not really a maintainer. I'm more of a starter. Uh, so... How did I deal with this? I managed to turn it into, let's write some ELISP. Uh, so I decided I would rewrite all this Node.js uh, into, into Emacs Lisp. So Marmalade is in flux at the moment um, and is slowly becoming a bunch of Emacs Lisp. And I hope that Marmalade is quite interesting because it's really conservative compared to Melpa and Elget. Because Marmalade is basically just an artifact repository. That's all it is. Um, anybody who does any development in the .NET world or the Java world will have come across Maven and Artifactory and NuGet and things like that. Uh, and that's all Marmalade really is. It's just one of those. Um, and it's quite sad, really, because we build a bunch of tools around that, and we, you end up invent, realizing... I, I sat down one day and started writing this tool, and I realized after about three hours, oh, God, no, I've invented Maven. Oh... And I had to go and shower. Um, but, uh, yeah, so what I'm trying to do with Marmalade is to push it down the sort of standard artifact repository route. And I hope that a bit like what Melpa's doing, I think there's a lot of synergies that, that we'll find later, hopefully, um, because I think it sits off the back of a GitHub repo. So there's a hook that fires Travis, and then when Travis is finished... You upload the artifact to Marmalade, maybe, um, or you make the um, package available in Melpa somehow. I don't know. But I think that 
uh, right now we've got a couple of different of, of these sorts of repositories and hopefully there won't be differences in terms of this choice later on the choice could be uh, do I want GPL only packages do I want packages for which that have been signed do I want packages that have been you know written by somebody with yellow hair I don't know um, but there should be a whole bunch of attributes that you can put down and say what they are about the packages you want to choose um, and then it just sorts those packages out. It really shouldn't matter if it's Melper or Railgate or, or whether they come from Darks or who cares. I mean, who cares where they come from? That's that's where we should be going to, I think. Do you want to? You've got, oh, you've got your eye. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But it doesn't work. Yes, uh, yes it does. <laughs> it does. So here's the, the story behind the Elgate. I, I want to uh, summarize again what the is about. I hope you were not sleeping before. <laughs> So the, the story behind it is that, uh, yes, uh, Tom Tromey did uh, ELPA and it was working, but uh, at this stage it was only able to accept um, software that were properly copyrighted to the Free Software Foundation. And uh, if you didn't uh, sign the paper and send the snail mail to the FSF in the USA and then get back the contract, then you couldn't assign the, the copyright to them and so you couldn't publish your software. So that was the first thing. And the second thing was that I, I was using some extension in Emacs that uh, were not maintained for a decade or about. So there was no hope at all that those guys, the authors of the extension, would uh, provide the FSF with any paper. Uh, I didn't even want to, to make a contact with them to know about that. I didn't think it was the right way to solve the practical problem I had just uh, that day. So I started working on ELGET and um, I didn't, uh, well, I, I really did like the way Git is not, not centralized at all. So anybody having a re Git repository has the full power over, over it uh, locally. So I made ELGET uh, like a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, recipe exchange stuff so that you don't need any ELGET um, repository server side to work to enjoy ELGET. On the other side, the drawback is that, uh, as was said before, uh, if you need to access a Darks hosted repository, you need Darks, the client. And uh, support lots of different methods, but that means you need to have all the clients for all those methods if you want them to work. That's the compromise. So that's the story behind it. So if I can just come back on that, one of the most crucial things I think where we're trying to get to is where we could facilitate a better copyright um, handling system than the FSF's got. So um, thinking back to Michael's talk, you have to submit papers, you actually have to submit real papers, right? Pieces of paper, this, this stuff. Not in the US, don't Really? Do they actually do it by PDF though? Goodness me. Oh, okay. So, wow. um, but one of the things wow. is that it, it would be great. You can put you can put flow control in front of GitHub repos really easily. You can just say before you're allowed to pull requests to here, you need to have signed this electronic form, stuff like that. Well, that should be enough for a lot of these um, protocols. And so we ought to be able to make, you know, classes of packages that have been approved in particular ways and say, oh, hey, you know, this is copyright approved or this isn't or whatever. Hi, um, there's a question from John Sturdy, and uh, he wanted this read out. Uh, the idea of extending Autoload to take a URL in place of a library name and interface that to a package downloaders. Your right. opinions on that? Yeah, I think I received um, a patch for that for ELGET, uh, which is not yet included, but uh, some, sometime I will find some time and review it. Thank you. It's a bit of a scary thing to do. You know, somebody said security, the word security. Oh, security. Um, but uh, I don't know what your thoughts on this. I've thought about jailing um, package downloads. So you, you just run them inside an ELIS jail that doesn't get to do anything. It can't go shell command RM minus RF. It's just not allowed to. Because one of the things is review of, of what the package yeah. does, right? Which the package system doesn't let you do. We used to download the file and that was crap. 
but you could see what it did because it was in your Emacs buffer before you emailed it. Um, so, you know, that's one alternative, just show people the contents of the packages or, you know, have some other way. I mean, from the, from the point of view of Melpy, you're, you're getting the, uh, the package source files down from the developer's repository. So I guess the assumption is there that if you trust the developer not to screw you over, um, you'll be fine. That doesn't quite apply to the, the packages that we build from, from the Emacs wiki pages. Um, but, um, I mean, I, I think the whole idea of having um, a snapshot-oriented package repository um, kind of goes hand in hand with what I think is probably the case, which is that I, I think that most developers really just want the latest code, uh, the latest versions of everything that they're using most of the time, maybe 90, 95% of the time. Um, yeah, I mean, that's certainly the case for me. Um, and I used to ach achieve it by having um, Git sub modules and, and that kind of thing. But yeah, it's... Uh, so I think um, many people will have the three systems installed because they will look for packages and uh, once they find the package on Melpa, then they find, oh, this is a package for Elgate. Okay, this is... Uh, okay. So I think um, what, what is happening already is that people have duplicates of packages mm -hmm. and then uh, people, users tend to, to, don't, to not know what versions of the package they're using. So there's all this, this shadowing thing of, of packages shadowing another package, uh, the, the same package, but a different version. And maybe we should think about solving this problem? I, well, I don't really know. I mean, I think um, if you have multiple package.el repositories, then that's a solved problem. Uh, it loads one version for you, and that's the version you've got. Um, if you add LGET as well, I might... I don't know. But which, which version, which, which package well, you will you load? You get the highest numbered version. Um, are you sure? Yeah, I think so. I yeah. mean, package will load the latest version, yes. right? Yes. But, but you have LGET as well. If you have LGET, then I don't know. I mean, it's all bets are off. Uh, uh, Dimitri well, could probably say. Uh, yes, you're right. All bets are off. Yeah. <laughs> um, so so maybe maybe you shouldn't set them all up in parallel I, I don't know I mean from, from from my point of view yeah it's the, the tricky question is really what, what if you've said hey I really like these package things so I'm gonna set up um, marmalade and melper and install all the stuff I've got and then you've got uh, you find some piece of code that you want to install locally um, for which there isn't a package um, what I would like to happen would be that you add it to a package repository, which may or may not involve you taking over maintainership or contacting the original author and getting that code in, um, which is usually fairly trivial to do, into a, a shape in which it can be um, installed as a package. That's what I would like to see happen. If you just pragmatically want to get things installed and done and up and running and, and going and you don't really care about the, the big picture for the, the community, you'll probably save time by just using LGET instead for everything. I think a lot of people just pick a package manager and they just stick with it yeah. as opposed to like mixing them. But Yeah, know. that could be the case. So the, the real answer about that is for ELGET is that uh, ELGET, if you install the package with a package install, which is ELPA, mm -hmm. uh, Steve answer is the right one. If you use ELGET install is instead, ELGET will find uh, the top level recipe depending on your setup. And you can always do uh, ELGET find recipe file uh, to, to look at it. And this recipe uh, will provide you a single method for that package, which will either be the upstream source, for example, GitHub, or the ELPA uh, type. And if it's ELPA, it will give the control back uh, to a package install, and then the, the answer from Steve applies. So it's, uh, it's not all bets are off. It's, it depends on your main recipe file, which is either the one given to you by ELGET itself, which usually targets upstream, or a recipe file that you made or uh, that you um, installed to override the ELGET default.
to get the to get back the end to uh, ELPA. So you have to sort it out by end, but the the result is uh, deterministic. Next question. Um, this is, I think, a really exciting time in that pretty much all these systems have come about just in the last few years. And uh, as one of you said, it's something that Emacs users have been screaming for for a very long time. Um, it seems to me that there are an awful lot of exciting solutions to an awful lot of different problems that different people have. And um, one thing that's slightly worrying now, I think touched on by the last question, is the possibility of um, duplication and fragmentation. It seems to me there are kind of two classes of entity that are really important in this equation. One is developers and the other is users. And there are several things that aren't very important. Um, one I think has already been touched on is, is disk space. It really doesn't matter how much uh, in the way of duplicate copies of stuff you have to install, provided you can sort out all the dependencies. Um, and another, actually, uh, I would suggest is, is software. If, if you're having to install lots of extra tools to get software from all sorts of different places, mm -hmm. that really doesn't matter too. You can delegate that to the pack back to the package system, to the package system on the underlying oper operating environment. It really doesn't matter. So it would be great, I think, if, if we could focus on, on solving the problems uh, that mean that, for example, almost all of the cool packages mentioned in the last talk, mm -hmm. um, it seems to me that very few of them had been discovered by their user through any of these package systems. Uh, so, it, so, so, so sorting, sorting that, and, and certainly that's, that's almost always my case, that, that I come across things through just Googling, basically, not, yeah. not, not, not yeah. through any form of uh, even semi-structured discovery. It would be really great to improve the visibility of all these amazing hacks by getting them into a more unified uh, presentation, even if underneath we still have an awful lot of mostly necessary software chaos delivering it all. Uh, I think uh, all, all those uh, extensions we just saw before, are available in ELGET. So if you do ELGET list packages, <laughs> you just have them all. And you can select them, and at the end you, you type a single letter command, and they're all installed and you can play with them. Hang on just a second. I think what, what is being asked is a different question. It's about discoverability, not about whether you can load them from Melpa or Marmalade. I think that all those packages are available in Marmalade, Melpa, and ELGET, right? And that's that's irrelevant. The problem is discoverability. Um, and you're absolutely right. Now, to me, the only answer to that is a better information system around them. Oh, <coughs> wiki! <coughs> Either that or we just get John to demo everything. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's actually a better solution, isn't yeah. it? John? But, Max but does it scale? <laughs> <laughs> well, if we kill him, uh, uh, clone his zombie. Then you'll bear a little lisp on the day that I die. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be you again, Nick. <laughs> Hello. Uh, we have Emacrocks too. What? Emacrocks. So yeah, we yeah. have some channels to discoverability, but we have list packages and EL get list packages. I think the, the, uh, the, the sure. question, the, the point stands, right? Yeah. Is that we've we've all got these package systems, and they show a little bit of information about the package, but they're rubbish for discoverability. They don't give you anything, really. You need to tie in a much richer information system around what the package does. Yeah. Um, we have exactly the same problem in Common Lisp. We have Quick Lisp, which is a package yes. um, loading and building and installation of dependencies system. It's wonderful, but it gets us nowhere with package discovery, and we are completely lost on that. So if you can come up with a more general solution than, than just Emacs, if anyone can, um, because there are millions of libraries out there and nobody knows where they are or how yeah. to tell, you know, there's hundreds of libraries with XML in the name. Which one do I use? Yeah, I mean, on, on Debian, for example, I'll just, um, you know, app cache search. Um, so yeah, as, as long as you've got decent descriptions somewhere and, and they're searchable, I think that goes a long way to, to providing that. But, yeah, it's, it's a hard problem. Thank you. 
non, a non-radical suggestion, since this is the uh, so everything is supposed to be oh so social these days, and which will solve another problem as well. Simply allow people, uh, uh, people who uh, use the packages who voted for them, if you've lo loaded them via package L or something, to vote for them, and, it's, and that's yeah. I installed into what can only be described as a distributed attribute disconnected from the package. The reason why disconnection from the package is important is because this could include another attribute. Is the, uh, is the upstream friendly? So now you can specifically ask for, uh, yeah. I only want to install packages whose maintainers are not, compl are not complete yeah. fleet. Just components. this last week we had a, a, an issue raised on, on Melpa saying, please can we have some download statistics and can we vote for packages? So it's, I, I don't think it's really core to the problem that we wanted to solve, so I'm not in a particular hurry to add it, but I, I think it, it does underscore that, that desire for um, understanding the quality of what's out there and discovering new things. Oh. Yeah. Uh, actually, package statistics would be fantastic because mm -hmm. it motivates maintainers and it also lets you start seeing people who install this package also install yeah. this. So I would totally <laughs> submit my stats if um, if that was there. The yeah. other thing I was curious about, because I, I actually like browsing through list packages every so often. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit intimidating. It's hard to see which what has been added. I'm glad Marmalade posts a list on Twitter of what's yeah. new. Melpa. Oh, yeah, sorry, Melpa. Yeah. Um, are there plans to, to include even better categorization aside from you know me just going through Emacs Wiki and then looking things up? Yeah, categories. Yeah, I mean, I guess you could break things down by the keywords that are in the files that you've packaged, that kind of thing, if, if you rely on those. Yeah. But, um... Hi. Um, so I, I don't know if this is a real problem that other people face. Um, but it kind of ties into the whole uh, versioning thing sort of a thing, right? Uh, so I uh, developed Clojure in my day job. So now Slime works with Conlisp, but a completely different version of Slime is required to work with Clojure, right? And then there is something called Rich in Clojure, which requires a third version of Slime. And now we have something called NREPL, which is the official way of using Clojure which requires you to have different libraries altogether. And they all conflict with Slime. So if you have Slime installed, NREPL will not install. And, mm. and so it, it's that's like... So a, that's not quite true. Uh, it doesn't work for me. I, I, uh, actually, what happens is uh, NREPL interaction mode and Slime interaction mode for closure files, mm -hmm. they conflict. Yeah. So if you have a closure file and you have NREPL interaction mode loaded, and then you try to load Slime, then that closure file go, pretty much goes to hell on my setup. So uh, It's not called Slime for nothing. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so my my uh, so what I do right now is I have tarballs of these slime uh, versions, and I use package install to install the right tarball, and then delete the folder and restart my Emacs when I want to use a different version of slime. So uh, basically, uh, what I was hoping for, or I don't know if it's if anybody else needs it, is, is to have multiple versions of the same thing and be able to say Ki, I don't want to load this, I want to load this particular one for this Emacs. Or maybe have some way of cleaning up the Emacs global namespace and reloading a different package system. Saying, okay, now I want to load this so that it will take effect. So the, the actual answer to this problem, I think, is a module system. Um, so that we don't have a single namespace and therefore we could load multiple versions of the same package into different namespaces. Maybe threads could give us that. Maybe um, if we get enough of this multiple Emacs protocol going it well enough, we could we could spin up another Emacs with another thing in it and talk seamlessly to it. Maybe we can do it that way. Um, but I think the actual answer is a module system. You know what? That's the elephant in the room. Nobody's talked about it at all today. Um, it's a massive, massive problem. Um, and I don't think it's going to go away quickly. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, it, it could also be considered a, a package dependency versioning issue because in the case of, um, of Slime for Clojure, you have to use this old uh, 2010 version. Um, but if you're using uh, Common Lisp as well, you might like to have a newer version installed. And it's not entirely unreasonable. Um, so what you really want is, is uh, to be able to have some sort of Clojure specific package which depends on a version range for Slime. And um, one of the glaring deficiencies um, in cases like this of, of package IL is that you can only say, I need at least version X. You, you can't specify any constraints beyond that. And in practice, what you get is just the, 
the highest numbered one in, uh, that's installed. So it's it's a weakness um, upstream, if you like, from uh, from where I'm looking. Um, it's hard to say. I mean, you get so much just with this very simplistic package system that we have right now that it's hard really to argue that you should just make it much more complex and then maybe break backwards compatibility with older versions of package.el or this kind of thing, you know, and require a whole other set of um, metadata inside the packages to say, well, I depend on at least this version of that, that library, but it better have not be higher than this other version. Um, I, I don't know if there's really a benefit there that's, that's big enough for that change to ever get pushed through. I'm not sure I ever really expect it to happen. Yeah, that would be nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Left as exercise to the reader. Yeah. Okay, so uh, with regard to the pre one of the previous questions about discoverability and searching and finding out what packages there were and what they did, there used to be something ages and ages ago when dinosaurs roamed the earth called the Emacs Lisp Archive. I don't know if anyone else here remembers it, uh, which did have a directory of all the packages and what they did. And, and uh, you know, I guess it stopped being maintained at some point and went away, but something like that could be reconstructed. And it did have standards for the keywords and all the things that went in the comments at the top. So I guess something like that should be resurrected. I, I don't think there's a problem with doing it, actually. I think we could do it very quickly. All of us could probably produce that index. It's just work, right? It'd probably take each of us a day. And I don't have a free day. Yeah. <laughs> you also have the question of, you know, is, is that information accurate upstream? You know, if, if you've ever written um, an e-list library, who knows what keywords you should put in? It's, uh, it's a relatively random grab bag of stuff, a bit like the customization groups. You know, does it belong under tools or does it belong under environment? Um, um, I, I don't know but how helpful that would be. That that's true. Right? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, that's one of the things we found with um, uh, with with Melpa. Um, because we're, we're grabbing source files directly from the, um, the developer's repositories, those files already have to be in the correct format at source. We, we don't really fix them up. Um, and so what we found is that in order to accept packages into Melpa, we've had to make sure that some of the upstream source code gets fixed. And so we filed um, scores of of pull requests and also sent away submitters of recipes and, um, and said, look, you need to get rid of your fork of this that you've just patched up the headers in and figure out how to get those changes into the authoritative version of the library upstream um, because you're not going to update your fork, are you? And sometimes they'll come back and say, well, yeah, I managed to get that change uh, merged upstream. Other times they'll say, well, so-and-so said I'm now the maintainer. Um, and so what I've quite enjoyed is that we're gradually improving the quality in, in some sense of, of some fraction of the code that's out there, some, some regularly used fraction of the code, um, and, and that makes me happy. Um, but that wouldn't happen in any other way either, would it? No, exactly. The way Melpa works. Yes, yeah, it's, it's one nice side effect of, um, of the scheme that we've, we've chosen, even if a negative side effect is you currently just get bleeding edge packages. I mean, similarly, we, we, we can't package libraries that come just from an HTTP URL by default. Um, they have to be versioned. We have to be able to know when it changed. Um, so it, in practice, that means in some cases, we do use the Emacs mirror versions of, of some libraries. Um, but a lot of the time, it ends up that um, we'll find the email address of the, the author in the file, and we'll email him and say, well, have you actually got a, a subversion repository or a Git repository somewhere? Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. You know, completely invisible to, to the rest of the internet. You, you get this, this handy URL then that you can build the packages from, and everything works just fine. So it, that's part of the process of pulling out this, this rich information and sticking it somewhere, um, the information about what does what and what might be helpful to to whom is is um, harder. 
Hi. Um, I guess I describe myself as a veteran of somewhat of this process in the common list community from about 10 years ago. Um, so I've been involved in a wiki-based uh, version, if, you, if anyone ever remembers ASDF install. Um, I also maintained CL build for a while, which was a sort of JH build, bleeding edge kind of thing. And my anecdotal observation, and it is an anecdote, is that each of these solutions that are similar in scope, they don't have the complexity of all the versioning things that some other things, each of these solutions works for about three or four years and then falls apart under the weight of differing requests for, I want this software that works with this version, somewhat like the slime discussion over there. It works for a little while and, and the simple gains that you get are brilliant, as you say, the, the ability to say, I want this software and it just comes, great. But, so my question to the panel is, how can you convince me that what you're doing now will be working in two years time? Uh, well, I, I personally wouldn't plan to convince you. If it stops working, stop using it. <laughs> um, but I, I don't know if there's a way to, to guarantee future success. The only answer I can uh, offer you is that uh, I won't try to fix that problem. Uh, you could give us money. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how, much? Uh, well, how much have you got? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I mean, uh, as the guys say, I don't, there isn't a solution, right? You come, I think, for... No, I, I disagree with that. I, uh, um, so th I don't. Want, I don't want to get into a contentious argument, but I think that Debian isn't perfect. Um, it's, you know, what it is. Obviously, you're shaking your hands, right? But um, Debian has lots of constraints against uh, people getting involved. Um, so we could talk about those, and some of those are political and community and stuff like that. But it's still quite a heavyweight process. I wouldn't want to see. A great big heavyweight process like that in in getting something into Emacs, I think that'd be nuts. Yeah. Um, the fact that it failed before, um, well, yeah, sure, but let's give it another go. Emacs is a totally different environment. It's much more um, bionic uh, and and supercharged, right? I mean, it's just it's just more uh, vibrant than maybe common list ever was. Oh dear, I've said something controversial. <laughs> I'm not going to fix that comment. <laughs> and I think that the, the way Debian um, manages to answer that question is exactly by not solving the problem at all. Uh, in Debian, you can only uh, be happy with uh, the version of the package that Debian did choose for you. If you want another one, you just lost. That's over, game over. And that's exactly the current answer we have, is that if you want to pick another version than the one we support, which is basically a bleeding edge, then game over. Same answer as Debian. There is basically a solution to this problem which scales very well, which is Ubuntu personal package archives. And that's, that's, that, 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 that expands to your next, to your yeah. next tier of different versions, bleeding edge code, Packaging things as they like. Yes. And it still retains all the ease. And you have exactly that with EL get recipes. Just maintain your own set of recipes. You right. can do that. EL get supports that use case. But it's already one system that you already have on your machine that works with any, any, any new software, any, any new uh, metadata schema, anything. It's, it, 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 it's all. It's all there with the existing um, packaging system, the existing uh, code for fetching all the packages. It all just works. I of course, of course, if the packages are uh, incompatible or buggy or whatever, then they can break your system just as nicely. But you don't have to do anything different to make it work in the first place. I don't really understand this. It only works if you've got APT, right? It only works if you've installed those PPAs. Yeah? It only works if... Uh, so. 
Right, right. So, um, I mean, there Absolutely. are APIs for Debian, right? Um, you can you can just add APT repositories. But I, I don't think that any of the approaches being taken here are, are problematic in that regard. You could just more add more um, Emacs, you know, ELPA repositories. LGET already can do all of this stuff. You could easily set up multiple LGET repositories because it just is one big repository, really. I, I mean, I think there's a question about versioning, but interversioning between PPAs and, and, and official Ubuntu repositories, there isn't a magic system there, right? It's just version numbers that you can depend on. If you don't have the PPA that's got the version number in it that you want, you're screwed, right? I mean, there's no magic here. It's just it's just file. Okay, so just, just changing topics a little bit. Um, going back to package discovery, um, one of the things I found very useful over the last few years is um, ideas like um, Technomancy's Emacs Center case, um, that sort of thing, where you, where you get somebody who's well respected in in the in the area, um, advertises you know a, a system that's ready to go, kind of like what Sam was saying earlier on with Emacs Live and Sasha uh, was kind of saying with you know promoting people's uh, dot, dot, dot Emacs. Emacs files, and I think that's very, very important, especially for new new people coming along to try and discover. Um, so, if if John was, for instance, able to give his talk, but with a pre pre made set of uh, Emacs files uh, from from his talk, that you know that that sort of stuff is excellent, and, and you know a great way into the system. Yeah, I mean, I I, th I think that absolutely spot on. One of the things that's really interesting about the what what Phil Lennigan guides. Um, Phil Hagelberg has, has done, the, the DMX starter kit, is that he made it packages. Um, so, I mean, if John doesn't use packages, but I've been badgering him and hopefully we'll get there in the end, right? But if if John had just expressed, uh, he could very quickly express what he, what he just showed. Everything that he just showed is, you know, John's um, package today, and it would just require all the things that he did. Um, and so it's a tiny, tiny, tiny little file and you could throw those around, and I think absolutely, you know, people can attach, though, you know, their uh, what is the word, uh, their gravitas to them, um, uh, and uh, you know, that's a great way for us all to learn. Is to say, oh, I want to see what uh, you know, Bozadir or Phil or or John or Sasha, um, any of these Emacs greats, and and just pull their thing, and and you know, oh wow, there's all these packages. And it's kind of a question of trust, isn't it? So I'm not really trying to convince you guys to f to fusionate your projects or anything like that, but d given your initial description of each project, uh, it's kind of difficult for me to see where 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 your mission is really different. I mean. Uh, Marmalade seems like a, a subset of what Melpa is interested in, the subset of putting things in an in a artifact, artifact factory and into, into a Maven repository, <laughs> if you want. And, <laughs> and I mean, Melpa and Elgat, uh, ideal in a computer theoretical world where we could just have Melpa use the code of Elgat in our server side. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not saying that, I'm not, I, it does something similar. I'm not saying that you should do that. I just say I'm just a better explanation. It seems that you could just take what he wants to do and what he he does, mm -hmm. fuse the two together. That's, that's exactly why I'm sitting in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> it's also because Dim, Dim and I really hate each other, so we're not actually allowed to make rules about us sitting together. So, uh, given that impression, uh, is there really any diff um, other than the fact that the code already exists, etc., etc., the, the social implications, etc., etc., and the work to do it, is there any technical reasons why a fusion would be impossible? Any ideas and projects there are. Well, I, th I mean, I think all the projects have borrowed from each other, so there is already a fusion. It's just it's come out as three big lumps. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I think it, the trouble is this is all, you know, we do this in our spare time, and I don't know about you, do you ever get paid to do this? 
<laughs> no. No, right. Uh, okay. So, uh, I certainly don't. Um, so, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. That's, that's kind. Thanks. Um, so, it, you know, we... I think we all know that there's there's synergies synergies uh, to be had. It's just it's not easy um, making them. We'll get there in the end, as I say. I already see marmalade as just the sort of static bit of Melpa, um, and Melpa is obviously related to Elget somehow. So uh, you know we'll get there in the end because this is Emacs and that's what we do. Um, uh, but it'll take a while. I, I think, I mean, if you had to sum it up, it's just three different philosophies, right? Elget is, I just want something installed, and I want it to work and be robust. Um, I'm, I have the tools necessary um, installed on my machine. Just, just go and get me that. Um, Marmalade is a collection of packages that other people have decided should be uploaded. Um, Melper is a, a catalog of code that other people have decided they would like to have uploaded and have therefore added recipes for. I mean, yeah, I think it's, it, it just really reflects the, the different personal preferences. And I'm, I'm not sure that, that we'd ever get Dimitri to, to exclusively use um, packages because he'd always be able to find um, a couple of libraries here or there that just aren't amenable to packaging. And, you know, there's, there's always a place for I'll get um, if that's what you fancy, and there's a there's a place for for just having um, packages that that people have uploaded with a specific version number. You know, if you're feeling um, conservative about what version of particular things you're installing, maybe that's the one for you. And, and the other thing is that uh, Elget uh, tries really hard not to make any kind of quality assurance on the mm. package. Uh, uh, that are available to you. So it's all at your own risk. Whereas I guess you guys are a little more conservative about what you include in your repository. Yeah, I mean, well, Marmalade will let you upload anything as long as it has valid headers. Um, okay. Melper, we look at the libraries, and if they don't have decent headers or if they seem unmaintained or have been replaced by something newer, we just don't include them. So there are quite a few obsolete packages that you'll find maybe on, on Marmalade that we've chosen not to, to include. Um, so there's, there's an element of curation there. I'm not saying that we would immediately be able to detect when such and such a library becomes obsolete and then we'd remove it from Mel, but that's probably not the case. But we're looking at everything that comes, comes in. So that's a different model too. And I, I guess when, when you accept recipes or not, um, you're, you're also reviewing them and deciding, well, you know, is, is that the best way to install this? Or is it on Emacs Mirror or on Emacs Wiki? Yeah, uh, we really do the, the little, uh, the, 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 little uh, the smallest amount of work possible yeah. when we review recipe. Basically, if someone got interested enough to write the recipe in the first place and send the recipe to us, mm -hmm. basically it's accepted. Yeah, and, and we just accept the recipes if it's going to result in a, a decent package. Hi guys, final question. Okay, just one, one last thing on that, just one last thing. I think that, uh, like I said at the start, one of the things is, you know, differentiation here should not be in this way. One of the things I would like us to see is a, a package repository that you could pay for that we would support, right? So if people wanted to pay $5 a month, we would guarantee that everything in that package repository worked. Um, if that's what people want, if nobody wants to pay for it, then fine, it, we, it won't be there. But if people wanted that, that could happen, right? It can't happen now, but maybe next year, maybe the year after, it will. So um, it's, it sounds like the, uh, the pipe dream of a grand unified, you know, package installation thing for users is maybe not going to happen anytime soon. But um, from the from the developer and from the packaging side, and I'm like a, I think a good example of, um, I, I don't know how typical this is, but I mean, for example, I've, I've used Emacs for almost probably 20 years and I'm embarrassed to say I've never written a single package and yet I have probably hundreds of hacks that I've never shared with people and I would love to. So uh, how, how do I 
yeah. even if I'm not going, you know, going to walk away from today with a, like a single answer of okay, this is this is the one way that everybody should install packages. It would be really great if I could walk away with um, uh, an answer for this is the best way to package to to, to build a package that is you know is in in the sort of so that I'm the best uh, responsible citizen in the Emacs space that is going to play nice with all these different solutions. So is, is there a best practice kind of document for that? And if not, could you guys get together and make one? Uh, so ELGET won't mind the way you choose to, to publish the package. So my answer is listen to them. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, the, the documentation for package.el specifies everything that you need to do, but essentially almost any um, standard formatted um, ELISP library, um, you know, with all those headers that you see in, in everything, that's the standard format. And the only thing that package.el adds to it is this magical package requires header, which specifies the name and, and version or minimum version of the packages you depend on. But that's, that's basically it. It's, uh, it's fairly straightforward, but the, the format is quite um, picky. You know, you need three semicolons, blah, blah, dot el ends here at the end of the file. Um, and yeah, you can run, uh, does check.doc cover that? Check yeah, so you can run check.doc um, on the, the file and it'll tell you whether or not you got things right to a certain extent. Hi, um, we just kind of, one okay. second, just yeah. final one, thing, yeah. One second, um, we'll do your screencast. Cool. Uh, we're kind of running short on time. There's two more talks, so I want to thank you guys. Please put your hands together for the panel.